candy boards, beehives. Some right here. We need to make a bunch of these. This is uh, something that we sell along with uh, quilt boxes, which are on below, which is I'm going to explain it, but I'm not going to go into the construction of those. I will go into uh, how I make these. I'll be making a production run. This one here happens to be for a 10 frame. I also make them for 8 frame. That would be the Langstroth Beehives. And we're going to talk about it, explain a little bit what it's for, how to make them, coming up. Hi, I'm Roger. Welcome to the shop. What we're going to talk about here today are candy boards for Langstroth Beehives. And this is uh, early July, and candy boards are something you would normally put on in November or December as you're winterizing your hives, depending on where you live. It may be a little earlier. I generally put mine on uh, usually right around Thanksgiving when we get a day that's uh, oh, in the 40s or 50s. Okay, what are they for? It's for an emergency feed, combination, winter bee escape. That's what this hole is right here. In case the front of the hive gets covered with snow, this is always up high enough that the bees will have access through the bottom right here. This area right here is never filled with sugar and they're able to get in and out to do cleansing flights or so on. Okay, so what goes in here? It's a sugar mixture of maybe you want to add some Honey Bee Healthy, maybe you want to add some pollen substitute. Uh, we do include a recipe, sample recipe with this when we ship them. And as I start out in the beginning of the sheet that has that recipe, you can ask 10 beekeepers about their candy board recipe and get at least 11 different answers. So it's, it varies, it's wild. Some people use fondant on here. I use a, uh, a sugar mixture. And I top this. This goes on top of the hive. We use uh, dull brood boxes and I try to leave at least one honey super on. So I would have two deep boxes, uh, honey super, medium super. This goes on top. Has the uh, sugar in it. And on top of this goes what's called a quilt box. And I'll explain this briefly, but I'm not going to go into detail on how to build it here. If you're interested, leave me a comment and maybe I'll make a video on how to do these. Uh, this one is used because you can see the bees decided to build a little comb on it when they actually went up through the candy board. They actually built some comb between this and the candy board. And that was in early spring before I could get in there to do anything about it. What this is, is a box, has a screen bottom. This is metal screen. If you're going to build one, don't use fiberglass screen. The bees will just chew right through it. Then you'll have a mess. This is filled with, you can either use uh, burlap or you can use wood shavings. I use wood shavings because I have a shop here and I have a planer and I have a chip collector and I have lots of wood shavings so they're, they're never in a shortage. And then on the side are vents, these are stainless steel. And it's a real good way to prevent moisture from condensing inside the hive and dripping back down on the bees. For, for starters, the sugar in the uh, candy board, it will be hard because of the way it's made. It will also absorb moisture, but there are three vents, two in the back corner, and of course one up here where the uh, bees could get to the uh, winter bee escape, that allow moisture-laden air to rise. And as that rises, rather than condensing and dripping back down on the bees, these wood chips, and of course you want to use, wood, or I should say wood shavings, you want to use dry wood shavings, of, don't use treated wood shavings, you want I usually have oak or walnut or pine or something in here. And I fill this up to just below these vents. So the wood shavings then absorb the moisture. And then as that moisture continues to rise, it evaporates and goes out the vents in the wintertime. And I do check these occasionally that, during the winter to make sure that they're, it's not some big block of ice. This is something that can be accessed without disturbing the bees, without chilling them. You can just walk up to the back of the hive, pop up the lid, check the wood shavings if they need to be changed. Easy to change, you're still not really disturbing the bees. Uh, I've never had to change this because of the amount of wood shavings I have in here. I've never found them to be soaked. But now we'll get back to the 
Candy boards. Okay, so on a candy board, I'll give you some dimensions here. This dimension across the top is 19 and a quarter, or excuse me, 16 and a quarter. And there is a rabbit here, which I'll get into as I make these, but I'm going to give you the dimensions of the raw cut pieces first. 16 and a quarter by two and a half. Two and a half this way. Side pieces are 19 and a quarter because there's a 3 8 rabbit here on each end. And this is for the 10 frame. Now, if you're making one for an 8 frame, this end piece will then be 13 and 3 quarter. So it'll be a little bit shorter here. And of course, the hole would move over. And we'll get into all that and how the ends are rabbited. The pieces inside, these are all the same size. They're four inches long with a 45 on them by two and two and three eighths. They are not the full two and a half because on the back is an inside rabbit where the wire mesh, this is half inch hardware cloth, is fastened. I don't go right out to the edge with the hardware cloth because if you did and then you set this on the hive, you'd have that little gap right there where that wire is and it makes a draft. And we don't need a draft there. And time of the year you would put this on, the bees would not have time to get in there and seal that up. So that's why I rabbit this in. That's why these braces are an eighth inch less than the two and a half inches on the sides. I'm going to be doing a production run of these because I need to make 40 of this size and I think 10 or 15 of the eight frame for an order we have. And it's unusual to have an order like that in the middle of the summer. This is usually something that uh, we sell a move pretty quick in the fall. So uh, actually I'll probably run over that because uh, like I say I'm going to do a production run. I'm going to make a bunch of them. That way I'll have some stocked up for uh, fall sales. I won't need to set everything all up again. If you're making these yourself uh, and you're only doing one or two, some of the processes I'm going to be using here probably won't really apply as far as the production part. Uh, actually cutting your pieces though a uh, lot of different ways to do it. I'll show you how I'm going to do it on a production thing here, but you know, for instance, this little rabbit in here, that could be done with a daddy stack, could be done on a router table. Um, I'm actually going to be using the table saw for it. And of course, drilling the holes, this is a one inch hole. It goes in the center. And if you should choose not to have that winter bee escape, you can either omit that, although I wouldn't, or you could put a cork in it if you need to uh, seal that off for some reason. Uh, these are not to be left on during the summer. They're not for summer feeding. It's definitely uh, what they call a winter emergency feed. There's a lot of different methods to do that. This happens to be the method I use. I've had great success with it. Have you ever lost a hive? Yeah, you bet. Every beekeeper has. And I lost one last winter. One out of three. So it happens. And explanation of why? No, oh, don't really know. Look fine in early March, but come April, everything in that particular hive was dead, and it was one of the stronger hives. So uh, don't think it was mite load because I monitor that pretty close, and I do do treatments with uh, both Apivar strips, when applicable, and uh, oxalic acid um, after all the honey supers are off, and I, I do a pretty stringent schedule of that so I, I don't think it was a mite situation in that one hive so I just really don't have any explanation but getting back to the candy boards I'm going to get set up uh, tell you a little bit about how I lay this out for production and when we're making a lot of them and then you can kind of take bits and pieces of that for yourself on how you want to build them if you're only building a few. One other thing I need to add about the uh, candy boards is you need a tamping block. This is nothing more than a piece of this happens to be Douglas fir this one here it's three and a half by three and a half by inch and a half and I do have the edges rounded and when you put your sugar mixture in here you just use this to tamp everything down and then let that set for 24 to 48 hours and then it'll harden up okay so right now yeah my grandson even poked his head in there for a little bit I've got my great granddaughter here she's not exactly going to help but uh, she came out to pay a visit this is Paisley I think you saw her if you watch my renovation house videos. You saw her in one of those, so we got a little bit of a bonus. Got to see the great granddaughter here. What I'm going to talk about here next is the lumber you're going to need for building the candy boards. 
And right here is a, a one by eight. And if a lot of uh, lumber yards have what they call a bargain bin or a bargain shelf, and that's where this stuff comes from. As you can see, it's pretty rough. And there's some defects in it. Of course, there's some knots. But because of the way the pieces are cut and laid out, I'll be cutting around all these defects. And like on the bad edges here, that'll be waste material. So you can use just about all the board. I've got a whole bunch of them stacked up here because I've got a lot of these to build. So that'll kind of give you a little bit of an idea on your lumber. I'm using one by eights because that's what was in the bargain bin. These pieces like this will get end up getting cut up for braces and cut around and all that stuff. Got a separate pile for that stuff. So if you do a little bit of planning, you can cut around a lot of the defects. This one here, it's quite a few in it. So uh, this board will be mostly cut up for brace pieces, but I can get some ends and sides out of it. <clears throat> one of those things where you don't see it on one side, and then you turn it over and you got that. So. Yeah, I can get one or two out of that. The rest will be braces. And this piece will be relegated to braces. But that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea on how you can cut around these defects when you buy budget lumber. Um, you could also buy select or high quality or clear. I choose not to do that because I have the time to fiddle with this. And it's actually a little bit of fun. Uh, that and lumber is very expensive. If you've gone to buy any, you've probably discovered that. Okay, I've got all my pieces cut, or I should say I have a lot of the pieces cut. Um, I do have all my end pieces cut, and they're not all sitting here because they'd be up here and you wouldn't be able to see me. And it's a combination of 1x12s and 1x8s, etc. Uh, these are for the 10 frame, these are for the 8 frame. These will need a rabbit cut. And I'm doing it before I rip them down to width, because then I could cut all the rabbits at once, and it goes a lot quicker to do that. I'm going to use table saw. On my first cut, I'll be making a cut three quarters of an inch from the fence to the back side of the blade. Not the side facing the fence, but the back side. Three quarter there because we have three quarter stock. With the blade up, three eighths of an inch. I'll show you how that works. Okay, so here's what it looks like, and my next cut will be taking it along the fence this way. That's why I have this raised auxiliary fence. So I'll be moving the fence three-eighths of an inch away from the fence side of the blade, and I'll be raising the blade to three-quarter. That'll take out this little piece. Before you go cutting a whole bunch of them, you're going to want to make sure that fits good. Okay, now that I have all of my ends rabbited, like the saw and the little of uh, what I need to do now is rip everything down to two and a half, both the ends and the sides, and I've got a whole lot of pieces to do. So it's just a matter of setting the rip fence out to two and a half, raise my blade up, and away we go.
I have kind of an assembly jig I use for when I'm building supers, so I'm going to make use of it here as well. I'm using Tight Bond 3 for glue, and I'm using inch and a half galvanized staples. So all you're really doing here is building a basic box. Just want to make sure that you have your rabbits for your wire up on all four sides and don't do one of them backwards. If you want to be exotic you could do dovetail or box joint corners but I don't feel that it's necessary for these. Oh, there you have your basic box. Next on the end opposite the winter entrance, I do this in each corner. That gives allows for ventilation up through which uh, will then go into my quilt board. You want to have that flush with your wire base in there because you are going to be hitting it with a staple. Using a clamp isn't absolutely necessary, it just makes it a little easier. Hey, then here on the other end, where your winter entrance is, we're going to make a piece that looks like this. And that gets centered right over where the entrance is. And I, the way I do this, just to make your life a little bit easier, I have a 90 degree, these are actually made for making picture frames. I use it for uh, this. Makes it a little bit easier to get staples in it without it moving around on that outside miter corner. This is what I like about it, it holds everything nice and tight. It's just some glue on your other miter surfaces here. Yeah, I could use a glue brush, but I like using my finger. Center that over your opening. Ridges up flush. And it'll look like this. Now I need to add a cross piece in here. I put this right in the center, just measure down 11 inches. Or I should say 10 inches, roughly. 9 and 7 eighths if you want to get split hairs. That just goes in there like so. And you want that flush with your rabbit.
Try not to blow a staple off the top when you do it. Okay, next will be cutting the wire put on it. Okay, the wire needs to be cut to fit inside your rabbits that are on the bottom here. What I do is get a mark of where I need to cut. This stuff will tear you up if you're not careful. It's, I really should have gloves on. This is half inch hardware cloth. Galvanized hardware cloth is what it's called. Try to get this flattened out a little more. You need to get your length. This gets stapled to the frame with quarter inch narrow crown staples that are a half inch long. Just kind of get things centered there. I start in one corner. I miss the wire. I'll go up to the other end, keeping it straight, making sure it all fits inside the rabbit. Keeping as tight as possible. And when I'm happy with that, I'll start going down the sides. So the corner, once again, as tight as possible. And I go about every three or, three or four inches. And then I also go down through the center. And I'm, near the vents, I also Put a couple. I don't know that it's really necessary. I just do it. And by the entrance, I'll do a couple. Okay, there you have it. One candy board. Fill that up with the way I do it is I uh, mix my candy. I pour it in there over and on a sheet of plastic. Um, I don't put newspaper in the bottom. Once in a while, I may do wax paper, but generally, I just set this on plastic, pour my candy in there, and let it set for a couple weeks. It'll turn hard as a brick. And I can just pick this up and set it on the hive when I need it. Okay, you got to see a little bit about uh, my prep. And, of course, you saw the assembly that um, I had shot when I did another batch earlier. I was no point in reshooting the same thing. And a little bit of uh, the production thing on how I did this. I've got 16 of these here completed right now, ready for paint, that are scheduled to go get shipped this uh, next week. Uh, I still have quite a few more to assemble, uh, but this was a good uh, little bit of a start here. And like I said, I needed to ship these next week, so they need to get done first. So how are these going to be finished? Well, they're going to be painted, and they're going to be painted white. Now, I have a preference in paint for exterior paint. This is uh, Pittsburgh paint, Grand Distinction. Paint and primer in one. It is not cheap is expensive. It's one of the more top-of-the-line paints. I know other people have their preferences. No, I'm not sponsored by Pittsburgh. This is just kind of one of my preferences. If you don't care about color, 
And in this case, color matters because I need to paint these white. And I'll be using uh, brand new purchase paint for that. But if you look at your uh, local paint store or hardware store or home center and go back to the oops I screwed up place, you can find what they call mist tints. This is usually anywhere from $35 to $45 a gallon depending on the color and where you get it and whether it's on sale or not. This here is a mist tint and I don't know if you can tell by that little thing on the top. It's a brown color and I have used this on uh, some things, most notably bad houses. But if you look at the price here, $9. So, and I've got quite a few other bizarre colors. In fact, some of my uh, B equipment is actually purple. Because I found a uh, purple mist tint, gallon for $9. And I needed to paint a bunch of the things. Uh, in fact, my candy boards I use on my hives are purple. As well as uh, a few of the honey supers. But it's just... Uh, Something to think about. Want to save some money. Of course, you saw as I was uh, in some of the assembly things, and there's no audio with it, just music that I added in because I had the radio on while I was doing that, and if I would have played the audio, I would have got a copyright hit, so can't do that. But you saw where I rounded the corners on these. Uh, do you have to round the corners? No. But 9 out of 10 honeybees surveyed prefer the rounded corners. No, I made that up. But the reason I do rounded corners, and I will be doing it in the future on my supers and uh, brood boxes and other components, is because it won't splinter. If you bump that against something, you won't splinter a corner out. And some people might say, well, no, you're exposing more end grain. Well, yes and no, but this seals better. It's a lot easier to seal this corner. In fact, I'll grab one of these give you a little bit of a close-up of it. It's a lot easier to seal this corner when it's rounded like this with a painter finish than it is just a square blunt end grain. This is more smoothed over and it, uh, in my experience in the past with cabinets and such, this is better. At least that's my preference. And that's one of the way, uh, that's one of the features of when we sell these. So a couple of the other things you saw was uh, the sanding. Of course all you guys that work do woodworking, I know how much everybody loves the sand. Um, actually I don't mind too much. Um, I've got the Triton oscillating sander back there and I have my Delta sanding table that made it easy uh, to do the rough sanding and then I finished up with the uh, the waltz there, the Smaller cordless one I used for with 80 grit for some small uh, touch sanding. Um, the corded electric I used with uh, 120 grit on it for the finish sanding to get this ready for paint, which I will be doing probably tomorrow after I go get some more paint. I thought I had a part of a gallon, but I guess I don't. But that gives you a little bit of an overview on the production part of it. So the next question somebody may have that is going to do this to as a business or possibly sell. How long does it take me to make one of these? It's, uh, it takes the same amount of time to make a 10 frame as it does to make the 8 frame. Material cost is, the difference is less than a dollar. This is just a little bit narrower than this, but it's the same length, it takes the same hardware, it takes the same equipment, it takes the same amount of time to assemble. I did all 16 of these of course, I cut the parts yesterday, um, that was the early part of the video, and I cut parts for a total of 60 of these candy boards. But to assemble these 16, as you saw a little bit of some of the stuff I did here, but otherwise the assembly from uh, what I shot last year, took me about 8 minutes per candy board to assemble it, because I have that jig and it goes very, very fast. And I do it as a production type thing. I uh, assemble all my frames first. They're set off to the side with the center brace in them. Then I come back after the glue is set for 20 minutes or so, and I put in the B escape piece, which you saw me uh, assemble on my little jig. And then I put these two corner braces in. 
Uh, the next thing I'll need to do after I paint these is put the wire in. Uh, the painting part, I've never really timed that. It's, uh, I do it with a small roller. Uh, yeah, I could spray them, but then I'd have to deal with overspray and trying to mask the inside. I don't really want paint on the inside. Only one on the outside and on the uh, two surfaces where they meet both the Honey Super and the quilt board or your inner cover or outer cover or however you're setting this up. So I haven't really uh, timed the paint. I do do three coats of the Pittsburgh Grand Ascension. Uh, very, very durable. Last several years, you won't need to worry about, you know, having to repaint it right away. Prep, of course, anytime you're painting anything, prep is extremely important. That's 90% of the job. If you don't have the surface prepped correctly, your paint's not going to adhere right, and it's not going to last. And the same thing as when I do coats of paint, I'll do a coat of paint on here. I'll let it dry for at least two hours if the weather's favorable, or even overnight before I put the next coat on. I don't put a coat on and then come back in, you know, five minutes and try to put another coat on, then another coat on, because you'll end up with paint that's going to peel. You don't want to do that. Or when you're trying to put the later coats on, you'll start lifting up the first coat you did because they're not cured. So take your time, have a little bit of patience. Okay, so next I'm going to be painting these and I'll give you a little bit of an illustration of that, but that won't be today. Okay, so after cutting all this wood and everything, uh, made the shop a mess. There was sawdust all over the floor, there was wood chips all over the floor. Uh, it's raining outside, but I do have the overhead doors open because the wind's not blowing and the rain's coming straight down. So, yeah, I, most of the time you either vacuum or sweep. You ever think of doing this? You can clean your shop in a hurry with one of these. Little shop tip. Cost. How much do they cost to make? Well, that depends on how you're making them. If you're making them one or two or three, it's going to cost you more than if you're making 66, like I'm making in this run right here altogether. So, okay, I'll get right straight forward here. How much do we sell these for? I sell one of these complete painted with a tamping block, which uh, I'll get into making here shortly, which is very, very simple. And it's basically made out of scraps. I sell these for $40, $39.95. That includes shipping anywhere in the continental United States. Whether it be the 10 frame or the 8 frame, they're the same price because labor is labor and it, my time is worth something. I don't do this for free. It is fun. I do enjoy doing woodworking. Uh, certain components I don't like. For instance, I have to paint these and I absolutely hate to paint. But Okay, so I'm selling them for $40. How much does it cost to make one? In raw materials, you're looking at about $4.80 per unit. No labor. That's just your raw materials. That's your wood, nails, glue, uh, your hardware cloth for the bottom, and the carton because you got to put it in a box to ship it in. Now, here's a little bit of a thing where I have an advantage over most people. We have an e-commerce business, uh, if you've watched any of my previous videos, where we sell plants and we ship them all over the country. Uh, plug flats, potted flats, perennials, potted plants, that type of thing. So therefore, we buy cartons by the truckload. So we get pallets of cartons, and I actually have a forklift, and we have cartons delivered, and I get pallets of cartons. We have certain cartons that are special made by a local company here for plug flats that we ship. So therefore, I could buy boxes way cheaper than you can probably buy them unless you're buying a pallet load. So a carton for one of these here, a, t a 10 frame, would cost me about 80 cents. Uh, a carton for an 8 frame would probably be 70, 75 cents, something like that. So you got to look at all your costs. And of course, uh, I have connections where I get lumber. Uh, a lot of times cheaper than most people can get it and uh, right now lumber is very expensive. Uh, when I went to buy the lumber for this I did happen on to a, a place where they had a lot of what they call damaged boards or that they a lot of some places call it what they call dunnage and it's a pile of stuff and it's a clearance thing and you go pick through and you get what you want and a 
lot of the boards I had were one by eights, but they were cheap. I mean, real cheap. And there was a lot of waste on them uh, because uh, when you're cutting two and a half inch wide pieces on a one by eight, which is seven and a quarter, you're going to have that waste piece on the end, and it's not wide enough to use for a brace block. It is wide enough to cut down to use for the cross brace, but there's still there's a lot of waste. And there's a lot of things I had to cut around, a lot of defects, uh, some damage. So if you're going to go out and you're going to buy clear lumber, it's going to be expensive. I haven't really priced it out that way. I do also have connections where I have uh, friends in the construction industry because I worked for so long in the construction industry where I, you know, I know house builders and contractors and they have a lot of scrap wood and they say, hey, Roger, you want to come and pick some of this up? Uh, yeah, sure, I'll come pick it up. The only thing is I, I can't pick and choose. I take it all. So I may end up with a lot of stuff that ends up in the uh, burn pit, but I get a lot of wood for free that way. Of course, this was not free because I needed so much of it and very specific sizes. But uh, I also have people that give me things, you know, hey, I don't want this anymore. You know, I got this big bench. You want it? Come and take it. And it's perfectly salvageable wood. And me being retired, I actually have the time to do that. Um, if you're working a full-time job and you're trying to do something like this, you probably don't have time to fool around with taking old things apart and trying to clean them up. But that's a little bit of the cover of what these actually cost to make. Like I said, if you're making one or two or three or just a few for yourself, it's going to cost you way more. And there again, your time has got to be worth something. Uh, we do sell these as a complete unit. Uh, it's what they call plug and play. Take it out of the box. Make, I don't sell it with the candy in it because it, that would get real expensive if I started trying to ship 20 pounds of sugar with this. But it's plug and play. You mix your stuff. You put it in there. You let it set for a couple of days. And boom, you go out and put it on your hive. You don't have to assemble anything. You don't have to paint anything. You don't have to fool with anything. All you got to do is mix the sugar up, put it in there, and away you go. Here's a little bit of an overview on uh, the actual costs of it and what we sell them for. Um, I'm not really worried about competition because we sell so many of them. I'm not. If you want to go and uh, get into the candy board business, have at it. But you're going to need a shop to do it. That's one of the other advantages I have here is I have all the tools to do it and I can do it fast. So, there's the cost. Okay, to uh, tamp down your sugar mixture into your candy board, you would use a block of wood. It's, and I supply one of these with every candy board. It's just basically a 2x4 cut into 3.5 inch long pieces. It makes a square. I'll give you a close up of this in a minute. And then of course I round the edges on the top side. So you have a nice way to grab it. And I do that here on the router table with a uh, round over bit. Yeah, I'll give you a little close up here. Two by four, cut into a three and a half inch length, one edge rounded over around the top, sanded. The bottom is left square, although I do round this over just a little bit so it doesn't splinter. And no finish on it or anything, it's just used to tamp the sugar down. And I'll kind of give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Okay, so you got your candy board, you got the wire in it, paint's dry. This one is. Uh, a used one. This has been used, so this is not brand new, but all my new ones right now are wet with paint, so I'm going to use one of my older ones here that just 
does not happen to have any sugar in it right now. So you you lay this down on a sheet of plastic. You mix your sugar according to whatever recipe you're using. You either be the one I supply with the candy board, or something you find online, or something maybe you invent. Uh, pour the sugar in mixture. Don't try to mix too much at a time unless you've got the a big drywall mixer in a five gallon bucket. That's what I do, but if you're mixing it by hand, don't do more than maybe eight pounds at the most at one time, or you're going to have a hard time mixing it. So you pour this in, you spread it out, and that's where this little block comes in. It's good to spread around. Take you back to when you were a kid playing in the sandbox, spreading it all around. Once you get it all spread out and even, just take this block and you tamp it down get any air pockets out and make it solid like so and once you do that you let it set for 24 to 48 hours then when you go to pick this up off the sheet of plastic this will be hard I mean it'll be like hard as a rock or at least it should be unless you put too much water in your sugar mixture and then you can take it out and uh, place it on your eyes did I mention I hate to paint this is the only part of the job I don't like. Putting the final coat on these now. Using a little foam roller. And of course you always want to get these edges because uh, water get in there it will rot your wood. And I just noticed right there I had a nail blow out. I'm going to have to cut that off. Surprised I didn't notice that before. Just like that. And of course I get paint all over me when I do this stuff. but uh, That's part of painting I guess. Okay so there's how I do candy boards in a uh, production type setting. I've got uh, a little better than 20 of them made now and 17 of them painted. I uh, still have wire to put into the ones I just did paint. But uh, if you're looking to buy a candy board, of course we sell these um, on Etsy in particular. Uh, if you want to make your own, that's fine too. But there's a very detailed way on how we do it. Uh, hope you got a little something out of this, and if you did, appreciate getting a thumbs up because it always helps the channel. And of course, we're always looking for subscribers, and next to that subscribe button is a little bell. If you click that bell, you'll be notified when I post another video. You never know what it might be of, because this is not just one thing we do here. We do all kinds of things. So, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.